guys so much into what I'm going to talk about, so that's like exactly what I needed. Sweet. Okay. I want to start with prayer, and then we'll get going. So just bow with me. Dear Lord, we come before you um, with humble hearts, knowing that we're just people, Lord, and you're God, and you're in charge, Lord, and you've done so much for us. And I just want to bring your peace into the room right now, Lord, and I pray that you will extend your grace to us as we're flawed people, Jesus, and we need you in so many ways, even we don't realize that. And I just pray that you will come into this space, Lord. I pray that you will help my nerves a little bit as I preach your word, God, and uh, yeah, just help the truth to really come through your word and through my words, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, so much. So no one knows me, so I should probably do that. So I am Josh. I am the new intern, youth pastor type person. So I'm just here for the summer. I go to college at Trinity International University in Chicago, and I'm pursuing a youth ministry degree there. I have three years done, so that's awesome. And yeah, I started my job, and they're like, hey, you want to preach to the whole church in two weeks? I'm like, bro, what? <laughs> but it's awesome. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not about me. It's about God. So I was like, let's go. Let's do it. So I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to bring the word. And we're going to talk about youth today. We're going to talk about just some things. And we actually have a big topic today. So I want to start this sermon out. I want to start it out by throwing out a quick statistic here. So we want to talk about real issues when we talk. So I need to prove to you first that this is, in fact, a real issue. So I was surfing around, and according to a website called The Great Opportunity, it states that, this is crazy, bear with me, it says, based on the current rates of retention and evangelism, it's estimated that 42 million young people could leave the church by 2050. Wow, 42 million. That's a lot of people. Wow, that's more than people in this room. You know? <laughs> that's awesome. So that is a number, 42 million. And that's a sad number, and that's a hard number, but it's a number that we have to take seriously. So I decided to do some digging, and I just wanted to find out how many young people there actually are, because that's put it in perspective a little bit. So according to the U.S. Census Bureau, they estimate that there are 41 million 731, 233 youth ages 10 to 19 in the United States. That's 13% of the total United States population. So yes, we know that the first stat, I said that 42 million is through 2050. So I'm not saying that every single youth ever is just leaving the church, because obviously not every youth is in the church, so we got to be smart about that. But we can't conclude that 42 million is a huge number, and that's a huge percentage of the youth that are going to be in the church. So, yeah, we can conclude that a lot of youth are going to leave the church. That's a huge majority, and that's a real problem that we have to address. We can't just let that happen. So that brings us to the real question at hand, right? we got to get to the root to it. So why are the youth leaving the church? Well, let me tell you a little bit. <laughs> so my goal and my life's mission, because I want you guys to know me a little bit first, is that every single youth would know Jesus. So you may say, Josh, that's a huge goal. Every youth, what are you talking about? Yeah, it is a huge goal, but I do serve a huge God, so that, <laughs> that's awesome. So that's cool. So we know what Jesus does, right? Jesus gives us hope. Jesus gives us something to live for. Looking through all this stuff, I found out that suicide is the second le leading cause of death for college-age youth and ages 12 to 18. So suicide, second cause of death. Depression is also a huge issue with teens. We are living in a hopeless world. But we as Christians, we know that we have hope, right? Our hope is in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. He makes us new. He gives us hope. Amen? Yeah. So we want youth to know that, and we want them to have the spirit of Jesus inside them, just like we do. We want them to have that hope, because we know that they are valued people, and they are important, even if they don't feel like it. So now I'm not going to stand up here and claim that I have all the answers. That's not my job. I've done a lot with youth, and I've worked in different churches and organizations, and I feel like God has gifted me at spreading the gospel to teenagers, and I feel like I've seen a lot in my short days. I'm not very old, as you can tell. So through seeing these things, I've come up with two main reasons that I've seen teenagers leaving the church after they graduate high school. And I just want to tell you that um, I'm not standing up here to condemn anybody. I'm not standing up here to say that we're all failing and that everybody's doing stuff wrong. No, I, I don't want to do that because that's not true. 
I just, I just want to go through some of the things that I have experienced in youth ministry and some of the things that I've seen and some of the statistics that we know are true, like the 42 million that I talked about. So these are the two reasons why I personally and through what I've seen think that the youth are leaving the church. And of course, these are, um, these are supported by scripture because what are we doing up here if we're not going to use the Bible and talk about Scripture? So we need to be doing that. The Scripture has more power than we ever realize. So the first reason that I think that youth are leaving the church um, is because I feel like a lot of times they do not have a strong support system. And again, these are one of the traps that I fall into too. This is by no means to shame or call anybody out. I just know as a church, we can be doing a lot better and we should be doing better. So a teacher of mine at Bible college She's the sweetest, uh, sweetest old lady I've ever met in my entire life. I love her so much. Um, so she's a teacher at Bible college. She says this. This is her big catchphrase thing. It's like, oh, she's in the room. She's going to say this. So she says, disciple making occurs in the context of meaningful relationships. So I'll repeat that. Disciple making occurs in the context of meaningful relationships. It does not say disciple making occurs in the context of awesome fun games or disciple making occurs in the context of great programs or in the context of Mountain Dew and pizza, even though that is the second most of it. No, just kidding. <laughs> it says that it occurs in the context of meaningful, intentional, valuable relationships. So as a youth leader, and this is something that I've fallen into so many times. It is so easy to get obsessed with what we are doing, how many students are in our youth group, the technology we're using, etc., that we forget about the students that we actually have in our youth group. These are real students going through real things, real struggles. These students, they don't need the best games. They need real, authentic relationships. So now I want to bring up one of my favorite Bible verses in the entire Bible. I know. This is 1 Thessalonians 2.8, and he read it at the beginning. I want to read it again. So up on the screen, we have the ESV version of it. ESV is awesome and probably my favorite Bible translation, but the one that I'm going to read off here is by the NLT, and I really like one of the words it uses here. And yeah, I know it's the same thing, but this one just speaks to me a little bit more. This version in the NLT, it says, we loved you so much um, that we did not just share the good news with you, but our lives as well. So, wow. So that means that we need to share our lives. Wow, Josh, that's a big deal. Yeah, it is, right? It is a big deal. But these students are amazing, beautiful people made in the image of God. They need people that will do life with them because, I mean, we know Jesus. Jesus did life with people, right? He traveled around with his disciples. He ate with his disciples, talking with them, serving with them. Some of the best moments that I've ever had with students are doing things like um, eating Taco Bell, drinking Mountain Dew, driving in the car, playing video games. I honestly haven't really had a major discipleship moment while I was upstage, on stage, just preaching to students. That's not when I've had these major life-changing moments with students. It's by doing life with them. Here's a phrase I came up with, and I really like what this encompasses. It says, um, teens need real relationships with real people that point them to a real God, right? So teens need real relationships with real people who point them to a real God. So I remember in high school, I had a sin that I was struggling with it, and the sin was really eating me up, and I really needed to admit and confess the sin. And I wasn't able to do that until I heard my youth pastor. He was talking in youth group, and he talked about the sin, right? He shared that this is something he struggled with. And because he admitted that to me and told me that that was something he had struggled with in the past, that gave me an opportunity to tell him and confess that. And that's a real relationship, that back and forth. So I challenge you to get out there and build real relationships because you don't have to be a youth leader to do this. You don't have to be in the youth group because this is the next generation of people. Like when we're all gone, they're going to be here and like it or not. And we got to deal with that. And we need to show these people of the living, loving God that we serve. But you may say, oh, Josh, they're on their phones all the time. Yeah, they are because they're looking for real relationships because they're not getting those in real life. Well, I know. Let us as the body of Christ come together around those who are struggling, and let's give them real, authentic 
intentional relationships. So another reason that I feel like um, uh, students are not getting support in the body of Christ is that they may feel like they have no space to talk about their doubts and questions. It was awesome um, when he shared his testimony. This is exactly what he talked about. He talked about doubts that he was having and questions that he was having. I remember once, this is a sad story, but it's a true story, so we got to talk about it. I remember once I was mentoring a student, and we had a conversation in the car. He's in seventh grade, and I was driving him home to his house. I remember he was kind of quiet, and just like, you know how kids like look out the window? Just like, okay, we're driving, whatever. And he was looking out the window, and I could tell that something was going through his mind. So I asked him what was on his mind. Like, what's, what's up, man? How's it going? I remember he was looking out the window, and he talked about the doubts he had been having. I remember, and this was hard to hear, he said something like, I hope that God is not mad at me that I have these questions. Wow, that's, that's deep right there. That's hard. So we then spent a huge time talking about um, tough questions, like why do bad things happen, and why has God not come back yet, etc. So... These questions, they weren't being answered because he was thinking that it was wrong to have doubts. And none of us can stand, none of us can come up here and say that we've never had doubts about our faith, right? This is something that everybody goes through. Like I, personally, I still struggle with some things that I have to really think about and really come into scripture, some doubts of my own. But that's one of the reasons that they call it faith, right? Because we have faith in Jesus that even though we have these questions, he still keeps his promises and he has still died on the cross for us. So we need to make sure that we give students the space to ask these questions and be listened to, right? If these questions aren't being asked by them, if they don't feel comfortable to ask the questions, you know these questions are going to eat them away. They're going to destroy them on the inside. So I would much rather have someone who actually has their own original thoughts than someone who just follows everything that they hear, right? We don't want people, you know, people that just get really excited about everything. We want people that actually think and critically think and learn and grow because it's good to search and it's good to discover things. So there comes a point in every single student's life when they need to examine their faith and they need to ask the question, and this is exactly what he's talking about, which is awesome. He said, am I a Christian because this is what my parents made me or because I really understand and have a relationship with Jesus? So every Christian, you know this, we have to make our faith our own. We can't live off our parents' faith our entire life. And yeah, it's the same Jesus that we worship. All of us worship the same Jesus. But everybody has to discover that Jesus and experience that Jesus for themselves. So when I was, when I was writing this, I thought about the story of Peter. And oh, Peter, you've done a lot of stuff. But um, this is a story of Peter walking on water. So Peter gets out of the boat. He starts walking. He starts cruising around. And then he starts to fall in, Right? So he starts walking on water, and he starts to fall into the water, and then Jesus says, what did Jesus say? He says, uh, oh, you have a little faith thing, but then he says, why did you doubt? And this is when it gets amazing. This is why, oh, Jesus is so cool. He said, <laughs> Jesus goes, why did you doubt? And then, listen up, he reached out his hand, right? He reaches out his hand. And this is from the scripture. I'm not making this up. He says, why did you doubt? He reaches out his hand. And then he got Peter, and he continues to, to disciple and serve with him. So isn't it amazing how simple a handout can be? Jesus could have just let Peter sink in and be like, gotcha, you don't got no faith, you, you got to swim now. <laughs> but because he did doubt, right? He doubted. He, he, he asked questions. He wasn't fully having faith in Jesus. But what does Jesus do with that, right? He reaches out. He reaches out, and that's amazing. Oh, that's so cool. Because maybe, and this is something that's so easy to apply to ministry, and honestly, I was thinking about this for youth, but we can apply this to life, right? We can apply this to everything, because how often do we see somebody different than, someone different than us who maybe we don't understand, or they um, struggle with a sin that maybe we've never struggled with, so we don't really understand that sin. And it's so easy to just let them fall away, to let them sink into the water, to let them drown, right? But that's not what Jesus does. He reaches out. And this is what we need to do. One thing I love about this is that 
Jesus still recognizes the doubt, right? He still says, why did you doubt? He doesn't just say, oh, we good, nothing happened, I didn't see you fall down there, you know? He still recognizes it. He still says, why did you doubt? But he says this with a hand out. Wow. There's so much wisdom here that can be applied to so many areas of our lives. Because like I said, we can be that handout that reaches out to hurting students. And we can take that moment and point it to Jesus, who is the ultimate solution, right? That is why we need, you guessed it, like I've been talking about this whole time, meaningful relationships. Because if we allow students to be honest with us and wrestle with their doubts with us, then we will be able to, in turn, give them biblical answers and loving answers that point them towards Jesus, the ultimate solution. Because if they keep all of these doubts and all of these questions hidden, like I said, it can start to eat them up from the inside out. And we need to be the support system for our students. There's so many students out here that have all these questions and all these doubts, and they're not being answered. And if we engage in meaningful and loving relationships, these questions will come out. Students just need you to listen. That's honestly as easy as it is. Because programs won't do it. The best games won't do it. Uh, Mountain Dew Baja Blast won't do it. But pro or relationships will. Authentic, real relationships. The second reason, this is where it gets a little bold. This is a very bold claim. But this is something that I personally have seen so many times in ministry. And it's a truth that we really need to come to grips with. So one of the main reasons that I personally have seen students fall away from the church after high school and leave is because, honestly, a lot of times they did not know Jesus in the first place. So that's the, that's the second point. They did not know Jesus in the first place. They came to church their whole life, right? They went to all the camps, but so often, here we go, so often they love the youth group more than they love Jesus. Yeah, isn't that crazy that we, we form a whole ministry around Jesus and sometimes that's why the students are coming. They're coming for youth group and not Jesus. Sometimes. And this should not be, right? Yeah, I want to tell you about something that I found myself a part of at a church I used to do ministry with. And I'm not trying to blame anybody. I'm not trying to um, say mean things about that church because I was part of it too. But this is something that I see so often and this is not how it should be. I remember the person in charge of us uh, they, they told us that we we're going to be going through one of the longer books of the Bible. And we had a lot of youth, youth coming to youth group, and we had, we had a good amount of kids, and they'd come for the nine square, and they'd come for the snack. We always had pretzels. I love pretzels. And, the, uh, and they came for their friends, right? So she said, we're going to be going through one of the longer books of the Bible. It doesn't matter which one. But she said, we're going to be going through the whole thing, the whole book, once a week. And it was one of those ones that's just around 30 chapters. So that's like a 30-week series on one book. And I sat with my students every week. And to be honest, we just heard a history lesson. And that's tough. The supervisor would tell us exactly what happened in the story. And then we would be done. And then we'd go back and play games. They did not offer any application or any connection to Jesus. And we just learned exactly what happened to the person in the book. And at the end, I was like, we talked about this man from the book more than we talked about Jesus, because it wasn't even Jesus we were learning about. And when I look back at that experience, I remember realizing that my students knew the Bible more than they knew Jesus. Listen to that. They knew the Bible more than they knew Jesus. Isn't that crazy that that can be a problem? But it can. They knew everything about that book of the Bible but so many of them did not have a personal relationship with Jesus himself. Does this mean we should just stop, just stop teaching the Bible, just throw it away? No, of course not. It means that we need to teach the Bible with the goal of teaching them about Jesus and telling them how this applies to their lives and how Jesus can transform you. So I always ask my students this question. I ask them, hey, do you know a lot about Jesus or do you know Jesus? Do you know a lot about Jesus, or do you know Jesus? This is a challenge that we really need to ask ourselves sometimes, too, because we, we can all fall into that a little bit. It's easy to focus on all the facts and all the stories and forget to focus on the one who made it all possible, right? 
Uh, the one who died for us on the cross and makes all of this a reality. This reminds me of the incredible verse that hopefully you all know. This is Philippians 3, 8. Now Philippians 3, 8, as you can see on the board, and you guys can read this with me because it's incredible. Okay, so, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Rubbish is, that's a good word right there. <laughs> that's awesome. So nothing is more important than knowing Christ, right? Yes, the Bible, it's very important. Knowing Christ is more important. Um, having fun is obviously very important, and we should be able to do that at youth group, but knowing Christ is way more important. Having good worship time, it's good, right? But knowing Christ is more important, right? Why are we focusing so much on having the best worship team, the best um, Little Caesars pizza, you know, the best worship, all that stuff, and not focusing on Christ. When we have students that don't even know Christ, we're focusing so much on these other things. And I know, especially seeing all these seniors up here, there are a lot of students here that know Christ. And that's amazing. That's awesome. I'm just saying, in the scope of youth ministry in general, all else, everything else is rubbish. They're still good. They're still good things. But if we don't know Christ, if we're not teaching students to have a relationship with him, all else is rubbish. Games, food, programs, events, etc. Our students, they need Jesus, and we cannot lose that focus. We cannot lose that focus. The thing is, right, I said, why, why, would, why would they leave, right? But why would they stay? This is why they're going to stay. They're going to stay for Jesus, right? My youth pastor in Becker, I was telling him about this sermon I'm like, yeah, I got this big topic. I want to I wanna do this right. I want Jesus to be involved in this. And he gave me a really good idea that I want to talk about quick. He told me in youth ministry, and he has a long history of youth ministry. He's been through a lot. He said, if you focus on things instead of Christ, then your students are going to find those things elsewhere. They're going to find those things outside of high school. So if students are coming to your youth group because of the games, they can find games, right? After high school, they can find beer pong at a, at a college party. They can find games at a party or something that isn't the best for them. That's a game, right? They, they can find games. If your students are coming for the food, they can find beer and wings at a bar, right, with all their friends. If your students are coming for friends, they can find friends at a club, right? That's friends. But if your students are coming because they have a relationship with Jesus then that is something that will transform their lives and in turn the lives of the people around them, right? Because they can find those things in other circles, but they can't find Jesus anywhere else than in a coveted, amazing relationship with him. So that brings us to one final, powerful, awesome question that will bring together everything that I've talked about today. Um, why did I stay? Why did I stay, right? I could have just left. I could have been out of here. No, look. Like, uh, this is what we've been talking about. I did not stay for all the programs. I did not stay for the great music, the cool games. Dodgeball's awesome, but that's not why I stayed. Um, I didn't stay for the great friends, even though they're amazing and I still talk to a lot of them. No, because like I said, I can find that stuff anywhere else. No. Why did I stay? Right. I stayed because of Jesus. I stayed because Jesus found me. He took me in. He died for my sins. He took me at my worst, and he said, I love you, and I want to have a personal relationship with you, and I want to be with you. Is that awesome? That's why I stayed. The quality of youth group, that's not why I stayed. The quality of Jesus is why I stayed, right? That's what we need to teach our students. That's what the youth need to know, because we are flawed, right? We can never do it right, but Jesus is flawless, and Jesus knows what he's doing. So I just want to end here, and I want to issue a challenge, right? Because I'm not just going to come up here and preach and then walk away, and you're like, well, what do we do? I want to issue a challenge here. It would mean so much, first off, if you pray for us, right? We're, we're doing ministry throughout the summer, and we really want to speak into lives of students. And so it would mean a lot if you would pray for us. It's important to pray for the youth group and pray for leaders, but I want you guys to take a moment throughout this week 
just to pray for students that do not know Jesus. Because maybe we do have youth groups full of students that know Jesus. But what about all the guys that don't know Jesus, right? That's who we need to focus on. They need a relationship with Jesus because that's the most important thing. Yeah, pray for teens that do not know Jesus. Pray for teens that don't have those important, meaningful relationships that I talked about. The second thing that I want you to do this week is just pray and be open to the Holy Spirit. This does not mean you have to um, sign up for the youth group and be a youth leader. If we got like 400 youth leaders, I don't know what we're about to do. (laughs) That'd be crazy. That'd be awesome. But just be open to the Holy Spirit. We are called by Jesus to make disciples, right? You don't have to be a youth leader and make disciples. We should all be doing that. We're called to make disciples. And sometimes the best way to do that is to just have open ears and open eyes. Maybe there's a teen that you keep seeing at the park when you go for a walk. And he's just sitting there alone. She's sitting there alone. Maybe one of your children has friends and you know their parents don't know Jesus or aren't following Jesus. What would it look like for you to talk to them, offer a valuable, meaningful, intentional relationship, and give them space to answer, ask questions, right? I just pray that you would have an open spirit in noticing situations like these. Because these students, they're craving authentic, intentional relationships. They're asking deep and meaningful questions, and they desperately need Jesus. Right. So, thank you so much, guys. I'm going to pray, and then... Yeah, we'll be done. I really encourage you to find one of these seniors and just, I know we prayed before, but that intentional prayer one-on-one, that's so important. So I would just encourage you to really reach out. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to preach the gospel. I just want to pray a prayer for all the, all the youth in the nation and in the world right now that don't know Jesus, Lord. Your heart hurts for them. I pray that they will come to know you and the power of your love, Jesus, and the power of what you did on the cross for us, Lord. Pray that you will encourage them and just teach them that there is more to this, Lord. You died for them to create a relationship with them, Lord. And I pray that as we go throughout our week, as we interact with people, we will be able to, um, we'll be able to share life with them, God, because that's what you created us to do. You created us to live together and disciple each other and multiply, Lord. Pray that you'll help us to do that and engage in intentional relationships with people. Lord, this walk is not a walk that we walk alone, God. We need people in this. We need friends. We need people to mentor. We need mentors ourselves, Lord. I pray that you'll help us to come together as the body of Christ, Lord. It's a body for a reason, God. I pray that you will help us to be intentional, answer questions, ask questions. And like I said, Lord... I want us to have real relationships and point students to a real Jesus. That's you. Thank you, God. Amen.